Well, thank you very much. Um, and let me know at the back of the room if, if you can't quite hear me. Okay, I'm getting a, a thumbs up. So it's a pleasure to be here um, speaking to you all about consumer food waste, diet quality, and agricultural resource use. It is not lost on me at all that uh, we're having lunch right after this. So this is kind of excellent programming. You can only imagine how much of an unpopular guy I am at dinner parties too, like all the food waste guys here. So, so thank you and glad to see that you all are still here as well. So I have no additional uh, disclosures beyond my, uh, my employment and I have two broad objectives for, for today's presentation. The first is just to provide an overview of the amount of food that is both lost and wasted globally, but I'm going to hone in on the U.S., which is where most of my work really focuses. Uh, and then to characterize the relationships between specifically consumer level food loss and waste uh, in the U.S. and its relationship to diet quality and also to agricultural resource use. So cropland use, which you could also consider in this context to be perhaps waste of cropland, right? Or waste or use of irrigation water, fertilizers, and pesticides. So as you know, that people throughout the world are regularly encouraged to improve their diet quality, and encouraged is probably a, um, a, a generous uh, a way to, to, to characterize it. But also that, that very little is known about this relationship between improved diet quality and food loss and waste. So in other words, if we were to heed our, um, our nutrition recommendations and we were to improve our diet quality, then what would that mean for, for food loss and waste, right? And at the same time, right, we, we have to recognize that very large amounts of agricultural inputs are used to produce food. And overuse of these inputs can negatively impact our natural resources like soil, air, and water, of course. And, you know, why we should, we should care about this for intrinsic purposes. We should care about this because we're interested in sustainability in and of itself, right? There's also some more practical reasons that, that we should care about this. And just one of them is that these negative impacts can reduce agricultural productivity in the future and it can make it more challenging to meet future food needs, right? So, I, I, you know, I, this isn't something that I, that I often, well, I, th I think previously had really made explicit in some of my, in some of my talks on food waste. And um, this is, I've you know, come to know that this is really important to really be explicit about what the difference in definitions between food loss and waste really are. And because they really are distinct concepts. And, and to make this even more confusing, that different institutions often have these kind of slightly different definitions for, for these terms. So what I'm gonna do is just for the purposes of, of this presentation, I hope my own definitions hold, but for the purposes of this presentation, I'm just gonna introduce um, some very simple ways to, to define food loss and waste. And food loss is for the purposes again of um, the next you know, 15, 20 minutes is the inedible portions of food that are discarded and discarded for, for whatever reason. And food waste are the edible portions that are discarded, again, uh, for whatever reason. So throughout the presentation, I'm gonna be sometimes talking about food loss and waste together, but I'm gonna do my, my darndest to make sure that when I'm talking about each one of these individually, that I'm gonna be explicit about that. So across, we're, we're talking now about, about food loss and waste uh, globally. And across different regions of the world and across different countries within those regions, food loss and waste occur at different points of the food systems. And for, for those of you that were here yesterday, this was alluded to. So what you're looking at here is on the y-axis, this is kilograms of waste per year. Uh, and on the, that's per person. And on the, on the x-axis, these are regions of the world, obviously. And what you see is, and the red is consumer level, food loss and waste. And those blue bars are the waste and loss that occurs in production to retailing. And what we see is that industrialized countries and industrialized regions of the world, a greater proportion of food loss and waste occurs at the consumer level compared to um, to, to other areas, to those that are currently in the industrialization process. There's a number of reasons that this happens, and, and um, just briefly, and this again was alluded to yesterday for those of you that were here, 
the technologies and the efficiencies that the industrialized world has developed and adopted really are, um, are excellent at reducing the amount of food that's lost in waste throughout the agricultural process, but then also throughout the cold storage and cold transport process, whereas you don't see that as much in the um, industrializing world, right? So we also see that as, as countries uh, and regions and also within individuals and households, as budgets, household, excuse me, as household income increases and they're, they're more, um, they find more monetary flexibility within the household, we also see that they move towards greater amounts of food waste and lost in the household. So I want to transition now to or really hone in to food loss and waste in the U.S. in particular. And really food loss and waste occurs at these multiple points in the food system, right? At the farm and ranch level, at the supply chain level, which we can also think about as the transport, excuse me, transportation level, and then also at the consumer level. And for different food products, and at this point they may be considered crops, at the supply chain level, the supply chain level, you know, for some crops and for some food products at this point, the supply chain is very lengthy, right? And so I put here what you might see from kind of a typical fruit and vegetable um, supply chain, right? And so they get, you know, up to about, you know, 10, 12 different stakeholders. And um, you can imagine the complexities that are involved in something like that and the amount of food that can be lost or wasted for any number of reasons just at that point in the food system. Now, there's a number of reasons, right, at each point of, these, of the food system that food loss and waste would occur. I'm not going to go through each of these in detail, but, and I should also say, too, that this is not an exhaustive list, but just a, just a few examples of why you might see food loss and waste. And at the farm and ranch level, obviously for some crops, the, uh, the stalks and roots are edible. For many, they're not, so they often get discarded. We want to adhere to its market standards, so we know at that point, if a certain food is blemished, it's not even going to leave the farm, right? So that might be food, that might be food waste, whereas the loss of stalks and uh, roots might be food loss. Also through the supply chain, um, we also have overstocking as an issue, spoilage, maintaining market standards, and then you often get product damage. And then there's a whole, there's a long list, um, and this is, again, just a kind of, for brevity, I've just listed a few of them, of why you might see food loss and waste at the consumer level. Now, this is kind of where the, the nuance starts to, to come in, and I find it you know, uh, particularly interesting. For example, at the farm and ranch level, you, get, you often get more loss than waste. Right now, again, that loss is, for the purposes of this presentation, is inedible, inedible food. That is, uh, that, is, that is discarded. Um, and you get more loss than waste at the farm and ranch level. The supply chain, we have um, more and more research is coming out about this to be able to characterize the difference between lost and waste at, at the supply chain or the transportation level. But what we're seeing is pretty similar amounts of food loss and waste at that phase of, this, of uh, the food system. And at the consumer level, we see a lot more waste than we see loss, right? So most of that is food that is being discarded that is otherwise uh, edible rather than food that's being discarded that's otherwise <laughs> inedible. So I want to hone in now on some work that we've done on consumer level food waste in the U.S. So again, this is at the household level and this is food that has been discarded that is edible. So edible food that has been thrown away. And so there's obviously this increasing interest in evaluating the relationship between diet quality and environmental impact and we've seen that with some pretty high profile um, studies that have been coming out lately and, and really, I mean, what we've really seen is a big jump just in the past, you know, five, even say 10 years. And Americans, as you know, are regularly encouraged to improve their diet quality and the question that we have is that if Americans did improve their diet quality, how would that affect the amount of food that's wasted in the household and also the associated use of cropland, irrigation water, pesticides, and fertilizers? And you might hear me refer to, as I kind of move through the results that, that I'm going to be presenting here, you might hear me refer to cropland waste, okay? Now that's just a much simpler um, way of saying the amount of cropland that is used to produce food that is ultimately discarded at the consumer level. So I don't intend to mean that the cropland was wasted by the producers. What I'm meaning is that the cropland was used to produce food that's eventually wasted by consumers. 
So what we use is uh, we've developed a biophysical simulation model. And for those of you that are modelers, this is a process-based model. And basically what it's doing is it's estimating how dietary shifts influence household level or consumer level waste and also the associated agricultural resources uh, that go along with that waste. And we return again to our just kind of oversimplified conceptualization or, or conceptual framework of the food system going from the farm and ranch level through the supply chain or the transportation level out to the consumer. And what we do is we collect data sources for each of these points in the supply chain from their publicly available data um, and we collect it at the farm and ranch level, at the supply chain level, and then at the consumer level. And so really what essentially what this model is doing is the user is inputting a certain diet, right? And so what we can do is we can, any of the popular or standard data sources that we have to estimate dietary intake we can use. What we often use is NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. So this is actual diets that are observed uh, or reported by individuals. And it's taking that diet and each of the foods that are contained in that diet, and it's working it from the consumer level backwards, right? So it takes it through all the processing conversions, and by processing, I, I don't mean a, uh, a value of whether it's, f it's healthy or unhealthy, just about whether the food is in its raw form or not. So it moves it through all of the processing conversions that would occur throughout this phase of the food system and back to the farm and ranch level so that you're able to see, for instance, if I consumed a certain diet, how much land would be used to produce that diet. Now, similarly, what we're able to do here with just a few tweaks of this is we're able to estimate how much land was used to produce the food that you threw away, edible food that you threw away at the consumer level, and how many agricultural resources were used to produce that food that you didn't eat. First thing that we see is that, on average, Americans waste about one pound of food per person per day. More specifically, this is 422 grams per person per day. And what we see is that greater diet quality is associated with greater amounts of food waste. So on the y-axis here, this is the daily per capita food waste in grams. And on the x-axis, this is a measure of diet quality. So we have lowest diet quality on the far left with that lightest color orange and the greatest diet quality on the far right, with that darker color orange. And we measure diet quality using the healthy eating index or the alternative healthy eating index for those of you that are, I'm sure many of you, or not all, are familiar with these. Um, the Healthy Eating Index measures adherence to the dietary guidelines for Americans, but there's a number of other indexes that are used. Um, essentially, this is just a measure of diet quality at the uh, population level. So as you can see, as you move from left to right, so you're increasing diet quality, we see greater amounts of food waste. And this bar here, this dashed horizontal bar, is the average, which is at 422 grams. So you might ask, your, ask yourself why. Why would you see an increasing amount of food waste as diet quality increases? And there's a few reasons for this, but one of the, um, one of the outstanding reasons is fruits and vegetables, right? Fruits and vegetables, with, which are health-promoting, they, they really move the needle on improving diet quality, but they're wasted at very, very high rates. So you can see here that what this represents here is that fruits and vegetables account for almost 40% of the daily per capita food that's wasted. We also see that the equivalent of about 30 million acres of cropland are used to produce food that's eventually wasted. And that accounts for about 7% of total cropland in the US. Just as an example, uh, our food is produced everywhere in the world. But if we were to um, use U.S. yields, that's what it would be, that's what it would represent. So here what we're showing, this is on the y-axis, this is the percent of harvested cropland that is wasted. Now again, this is, when I say cropland waste, this is the crop, excuse me, cropland that's used to produce food that's eventually wasted at the consumer level, cropland waste. And on the, the x-axis, we see the uh, different cropland types. So here we have total cropland, about 7% is wasted from just at the consumer level, just from consumers throwing away edible food. But what we also see is that about 55 to 65 percent of fruit and vegetable cropland is wasted.
We also see that greater diet quality is associated with less cropland waste, but greater waste of irrigation water and pesticides. So here is, first I'm showing cropland. Again, we have our diet quality quintile. So this is lowest diet quality on the far left to greatest diet quality as you move to the far right. And on the y-axis is uh, millions of acres of cropland that's wasted. So you might think, okay, well, why are we seeing that? Well, one of the driving, predominantly driving reasons that we see that is, again, due to fruits and vegetables, which are health promoting, but don't require as much cropland, require actually very small amounts of cropland compared to other types of, of crops, particularly grains and oil seeds. They do use a lot of irrigation water, which is why we, one of the reasons why we see an increase in the amount of irrigation water that is wasted as diet quality increases, and also with pesticide use. We don't see a relationship, though, with uh, nitrogen fertilizer, potash fertilizer, or phosphorus fertilizer. So here's, you know, we start to get into some of these more nuanced and I think are really important messages that consumers should really strive to improve their diet quality and to reduce food waste simultaneously. And I may be opening Pandora's box, and I often am when I start to get into this type of conversation about whether diet quality is associated with environmental impact. And there's multiple camps to this. And I um, don't believe that what we're, for example, what we're seeing here is that diet quality, as diet quality increases, we see greater impact on the environment from food waste, right? So the picture is not clear. I think that, that many scientists, would, would, you know, what we'd like to see, it's kind of wishful thinking, what we'd like to see in the message that I think is unfortunate that we're putting forward, because it's not based on the data that we have available, is that greater diet quality leads to more sustainable environmental outcomes. That's true in some circumstances and for some environmental indicators, but that's not true for all, and so I don't believe that we can make that blanket statement right now, and I think it's, um, quite confusing to, to consumers as well. There's a lot more work that needs to be done in this area, and we might, might turn out that, that they are related in the way that we would hope, but um, we're not seeing that quite yet. So reducing household food waste can increase food budgets, right? And that can free up money to spend on healthy foods. So you might read that and think, yeah, well, that money could be used to be spent on unhealthy foods too. And I'd say, you're exactly right. That's why they're not the same thing. Food, reducing food waste and increasing diet quality are not the same thing, and doing one will not necessarily lead to the other. That's why we need to promote improved diet quality and reducing food waste at the same time, rather than assuming that one is going to lead to the other. And I won't go through these in detail, but you know, I've just listed them here as a few innovative efforts to reduce food waste that are either being developed or are already being implemented, both at the system level and at the individual level. So I've listed them in reverse order here, uh, largely at the individual level here and at the, uh, the system level here. And so you might be familiar with these, either whether they've, some of them are related to um, recent legislation that's kind of moving through implementation now into the markets. Some is being proposed now, and there's, uh, there's kind of, ge we're gearing up a lot of the research in, in these areas. And one of the hot areas is, um, is these food apps, right? There seems to kind of be an app for everything nowadays, and there's, there's apps here for, for meal portioning and reducing food waste as well. So I'm just going to end here with a key, few key takeaways. Um, I'm sure you're all hungry and <laughs> eager to not waste your lunches. So um, I can close with just a few things that I, I really want to reiterate that greater diet quality does not necessarily lead to reduced environmental burden. Here I just showed that greater diet quality leads to greater amounts of food waste. But I think that we can, you know, that's often, you know, we, a lot of these studies, what they're doing is they're, they're assuming that, um, that for example, meat-based diets, diets with high amounts of meat are unhealthy, and then they kind of try to correlate that with environmental impact, and then they extrapolate that into, well, as we increase our diet quality, they're reducing meat intake, we're, um, we're improving our, we're, we're reducing our environmental burden. And I think that's a big jump to make, and that's where the state of the science is right now. It's largely focusing on meat intake. Um, and I think that as the research progresses, we'll see more nuances in this area. So again, consumers should pursue these goals simultaneously, right? Doing one is not necessarily gonna accomplish the other. 
And just a, just a closing point here that, that efforts to reduce food waste at the consumer level um, and also those efforts to improve diet quality are going to be most successful if we emphasize, I believe, cost savings for the consumer, which, you know, you tell them that, well, this is going to be the healthiest thing for you. <clears throat> that does drive some consumer behavior, but a lot of consumer behavior is driven by the cost, right, of the foods, especially if they're told that they can save a dollar or several on, on, food, on their food. Also, taste, and I use taste just as a kind of a stand-in for other sensory properties, right? Because we also know that aroma, mouthfeel, palatability is just as important. And then convenience. So consumers are not going to be trade uh, a lot of, the, you know, they're not going to trade the health benefits for, for lack of convenience. So um, these are all things that need, to be, that need to be considered as we are moving forward in, in our research and in implementing these, uh, these initiatives at the consumer level. And with that, I, I thank you very much, and I'm, I'm here to take any questions if there's time.